can. I hope not too many people had to go. No, no, no. We're, they're coming back. That's good. We'll file in here. We'll have a good number. It's a little bit past eight, but that's okay. You know, I don't know if uh, how many of you uh, have attended lectureships before. We used to have lectureships at Tennessee Bible College as I was a student and later was given the privilege to teach there. Uh, lectureships would go all week long. And so we would have about uh, seven, sometimes eight lessons a day for four days in a row. And if you were a student, you're required to take notes for all the lessons. So if you didn't, you'd get a failing grade. So not only did you have to attend, you had to pay attention. <laughs> and, and some of the lessons were just about the most boring things you could probably ever listen to. But what I found about, at least for me, and I can be just as honest as I can possibly uh, be to you, I just love this time. And um, I get to get my bucket filled up without having to dig it out all myself. And these brothers do a good job. And I know they would because they got the right framework. So I'm going to repeat this illustration again. When you put a puzzle together, you put the border frame first. At least you should. If you don't do a puzzle that way, you're crazy. So you put the borders, right? Sure you do. You know from that point on, every piece goes somewhere within the border, not outside the border. Once you get the time frame of shortly to come to pass in the beginning of the book, and then at the end of the book, it is to guarantee that everything in between is about the same subject, not a different subject. So when I assigned the subject matter to the speakers, I knew that we would have remarkable agreement. Now, we may not agree about every single nuance. It's still a profound book, and I don't know that we'll ever understand all of the great significances of the different nuances within the book. But we will have such clarity that we will have greater clarity than you've ever heard before. I know that. And uh, Brother Robert Buna, who is uh, from Romania originally, and the first time that I met him, I was taken by the way that he uh, spoke. There's just something melodic about the way that he speaks. I just really like it. And because of that, I've become aware of the Romanian accent. So just on vacation, I was on the airplane, and I asked the guy sitting next to me, are you from Romania? And he said, yes. I was so proud of myself, you know, being able to detect that. <laughs> and I said, well, I have a friend I met from Romania. And then Gloria and I were coming back from Pennsylvania. There was a guy who was in an expedited freight uh, business, and uh, I just struck up a conversation. Sometimes I do. I'm not the shyest guy around, you know. <laughs> And, you know, I said, how are you today? He said, oh, just fine. I'm tired. I said, oh, where are you from? And he begins to talk. I said, are you from Romania? He said, how did you know? I said, I've got a good friend who's from Romania. It's just a cool way of talking. So anyways, but this particular Romanian, this rambling Romanian who got everybody sick in California because he drives so fast. You know, Europeans, <laughs> did you know that Europeans drive like they are already, they're, they're late for everything? That's the way it is in Europe. It is. You were just in Europe. Uh, Brent did, uh, had uh, a vacation. That's where this Romanian, <laughs> that's, that's where this Romanian learned to drive. It was in Europe because he's still driving that way. And he got poor John Watson, sick as a dog. And they'll have to tell you that story sometime because they were going out to see the, uh, the big redwoods, right? And... Uh, uh, Robert Bonham was going too fast for John Watson. And uh, that was a good story, by the way. We, I appreciated that. Um, I, 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 I <laughs> poor guy got sick and as he was heaving the hose. Uh, his uh, cell phone had fallen out of his pocket and he got. Oh, that was Trent? That was Trent. Oh, you got two guys sick? Three, actually. <laughs> Oh my, that's so funny. Anyways, but other than him making everybody sick in California, Robert is a wonderful man. He's a great guy to talk to. 
and we appreciate him so much. And he's a good thinker, and he likes to um, study the Bible. And uh, because he believes that Jesus returned, he has nuances that other people won't figure out because you can't figure it out until you get the nuance, you, you, you get the time frame right, then you get the nuances right. So Robert's going to come. He's going to preach a lesson on Revelation chapter 11. And this is one of the key texts of the Bible. And so I think Robert's going to do a wonderful job. And go ahead and take us to the top of the hour, 9 o'clock. And if it's, uh, you're still going by then, uh, just turn off the lights when you, uh, when you leave. Because we're leaving at 9. So come on and preach. All right, so first of all, I want to uh, say a big thank you uh, for you being here and for the time that you, we're going to spend together. I want to uh, thank you uh, for, uh, you know, hosting this for, our, for your hospitality, specifically you and Gloria. I would like to uh, thank you, uh, both uh, uh, our people here and those online. And I would like to also give a special thanks to those that are here in the room or watching online that are not in agreement with us. I know it takes a, an extra effort to listen to someone that you don't agree with. And therefore, I want you to know that your ef ex this extra effort is certainly appreciated. Uh, before I start, I want to make two uh, disclaimers. Uh, I, You're not on video, Robert. Uh, yeah, yeah, I am. I am, yeah. I am. Um, I'm right there. So talking about this, I have two disclaimers to make. First of all, I want you to, uh, to know that I'm not a minister, I'm not a preacher, and I don't have any degree in any formal theological uh, institution. I'm just a simple student of the Bible who's very passionate about it and who chose this at some point in time, about 10 years ago, to leave aside all the preconceived ideas to leave aside all the doctrines that don't fit with the biblical truth and just follow some simple principles like audience relevance and like scripture interprets scripture. And that's what I want to talk to you uh, tonight. Some of my findings on uh, my own. And because I'm not a preacher, I don't think I belong there. The second disclaimer is, and he uh, already alluded to it, well, he disclosed it completely, that my accent is not from Kentucky. Sorry, Roy. Uh, I, uh, I was born and raised in Romania, and I came here in the United States, the land of the free, uh, when I was 31 years old. So uh, since this is the land of the free, I'm not going to let Holger to put me back in a box. So I'm going to be here for the rest of the night. And I want to... Uh, thank Chad that he accommodate me with that. Um, but with the same token, I would like to uh, ask you for your um, grace and for your uh, understanding if my um, English would uh, sound at times a little bit funny. Uh, however, not all is lost because Jesus said, uh, no prophet is without honor except in his own country. Well, since I'm not in this country, this is probably going to work to my advantage. <laughs> Uh, with that being said, let's get started because we have a lot to cover. Let me get on the clicker. We're going to talk about um, the book of Revelation chapter 11. And if you read it, uh, it's pretty easy to um, um, segment the, um, the book in three uh, sections. The measurement of the temple, the two witnesses, and the sounding of the trumpet. However, if you read and look for topics in the book of Revelation, you're going to find pretty much every single topic in eschatology, you're going to find it in Revelation 11. Uh, Holger was right. It's a key chapter in the book of Revelation. So you're going to find destruction of, this, of the city and the temple. You're going to find signs and wonder. You're going to si find persecution, death and vindication of God witnesses. If you're ever looking for a passage uh, for about judgment, resurrection, and the rewarding of the saints, Revelation 11 is probably one place you can go. 
wrath, woes, and tribulation you're going to find there. You're going to find com the coming of the kingdom and the definitive rule of God. And one of the important things that we're going to hopefully get to, please, uh, is uh, change of the covenants. We're going to talk about all these, hopefully all these. So you want me to talk about all these in 45 minutes. So let's get started with part one. And there was, a, there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and, they, uh, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. When it comes to the book of Revelation in general, I would say there are uh, two common mistakes that are being made, both by, you know, students, simple students like myself or people that uh, are considered scholars, that if we address these two common mistakes and we correct them, the chances to understand the book of Revelation in general and chapter 11 as well, um, we're going we're gonna to have much better chances to understand it and to properly interpret it. The first mistake that I think is being made is honoring the uh, imminence uh, statements, or rather dishonoring the uh, imminence statements. Uh, shortly at hand, we talked about it from John all, uh, onward. Each speaker alluded to that. I'm not going to spend much time on that. The second one, however, is the dating of the book of Revelation. Specifically, whether the book of Revelation was written before 70 AD or after 70 AD. And I'm going to uh, submit to you tonight, I'm going to try to prove that the Revelation 11 is one of the most powerful proof, internal proof, that the book of Revelation was written prior to 70 AD. If we look at the first two verses, we're going to find quite a few key elements that will help us in determining that. First one, the holy city. Well, if you want to be consistent with the rest of the Bible, you're going to have to admit that the holy city in the Bible is no other city but Jerusalem. And you can see that in Nehemiah, in Isaiah, and in Matthew. Another element that appears there is the temple, the altar, the outside court. All these are, are um, elements that belong to the Ju Jerusalem's temple. After 70 AD, these elements are all gone. You don't have them. They have to be in there. Another important um, uh, coincidence, somebody was talking here about coincidence, is the 42 months, three and a half years. Well, it so happens, a coincidence, that the siege on Jerusalem lasted three and a half years, from early springs of uh, 67 AD to the late summer of uh, 70 AD. Another element is those who worship therein. I want to suggest to you that worship there is in the present tense, present active indicative, which means by the time John received the revelation, somebody was worshiping in a temple, in the altar, and in the, uh, uh, in the holy city. So you, ha you, you cannot have that after 70 AD. That worshiping was no longer there after uh, 70 AD or 93 when the uh, uh, proponents of the uh, late day date are telling us. And another one that I really, really like, because Jesus is speaking, uh, we have in uh, Revelation uh, 11, uh, second, the second verse says, Gentiles would tread under the foot, under the foot, the holy city. Well, this happens to be the exact same words that Jesus spoke in Luke 21, 24. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles will be fulfilled. Well, we certainly know what this co the context for this text is, and uh, is the uh, destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Uh, Jesus is clear there, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies. So we have the exact same statement in both places, which means, w along with the rest of the coincidences, that the book of Revelation was written prior to 70 AD to have all these in place. But some may still uh, counter-argue uh, with, uh, with the proof that I just showed you. One of them is, can verses 1 and 2 be an, uh, an uh, analepsis? Analepsis is a fancy word for um, what we would call a flashback. So it's actually the um, um, opposite of prolapsis. So prolapsis is, I'm talking now about some events that they are so sure that although they are they're going to happen in the near future, it's almost like they're now. 
uh, analepsis goes the other way. So I'm talking about some events now, but really they happened in the past. So can John talk now about things that happened in the past? Well, I say no. And the reason is, John, once he gets his revelation, is supposed to take action to rise and measure. He cannot do that after uh, that the temple is, uh, uh, is gone. An uh, analogy for, um, for the, uh, uh, for, for, of today would be, uh, let's say I, um, I go to my friend uh, John here, and I'm going to say, uh, John, I'm going to pay you for, a, uh, for you to make a trip and to go to uh, measure the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center. What would John think about me? He will say, Robert, have you lost your mind? Basically, the towers are gone for like two, uh, two decades almost now, right? Well, we don't see any kind of reaction like that from the John the Revelator, because otherwise he would have at least said something like, uh, God, you know, the temple has been gone for like two decades now. We don't see that, so it, it, it's similarly awkward. Another ar counter argument is: Can the temple mean a future uh, or a spiritual? Can mean a future or a, a future spiritual heavenly uh, temple? I would say no, because the heavenly temple cannot be a subject for another measurement. We're going to go into measurement a little later, uh, which means uh, evaluation or remake. The heavenly temple is perfect; it doesn't need another measurement. The other, uh, the other uh, reason I say no is because Gentiles cannot tread under the foot a spiritual entity. And then again, we go back to that worship present tense. Somebody has to worship while John is writing Revelation. You cannot get over that. So, who are, whom are you going to uh, listen to? Are you going to take the external uh, evidence that Uranus, which is really the only single main proof for a late date of uh, Revelation, or you're going to listen to Jesus and the internal proof, the internal proof and, uh, that you find in the Bible, which is inspired. I'm going to go with Jesus. Amen. Um, I, um, another consideration I want to do with the about the two first uh, verses is the word measuring. Measuring there is a key verse because it not only means that, that uh, God is preparing a judgment to the subject that is being measured, but more practically, it's God is looking at the subject, it's evaluating it, it looks at it, and then it plans for a renewal also, or a restoration, a makeover. And you can see that in Ezekiel and in Zechariah. Let me give you an example. Um, let's say you have an old house, and you go uh, and you want to remodel it. And you go in each room and um, you have, you know, old rooms, old kitchen, kitchen cabinets. And then in the backyard, you have a, um, a deck, which is so rotten that it's even unsafe to walk on. So what you're going to do? You're going to take a tape measure and you're going to start measuring the rooms. You're going to measure the floor to see how much material you want in there. You're going to measure the kitchen cabinets. You get outside, what you're going to do? You're not going to measure anything. You're going to just rip the whole thing apart and take it to the dumpster. I think the same analogy can be applied to this, when it says, measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. I think it talks about the faithful Jews that will be judged, would be judged but then brought into a new kingdom. They will, make, they will be made new. They will be transformed. That's why they're measured. But then it says, do not measure the court outside the temple, because that refers to those Jews that uh, have been uh, unfaithful, for they are spiritually de uh, dead, and there is no renewal for them. They are set to perish. I believe, excuse me, I believe that this, two, uh, th this analogy, measure, do not measure, is the exact same analogy that we find in Matthew 25, th uh, 31 and following, where we, where we have the separation of the goats and the sheep. One are being measured and renewed and bring into inheritance of God. The other ones are perished into the uh, uh, eternal fire. Hey, we're actually doing good on time. Let's move to part two, the two witnesses. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to try to give you a uh, reader digest of, the, uh, of this section. So we have these two um, characters, these two... Uh, 
uh, witnesses that are uh, getting uh, power from uh, God to prophesy. They are able to do all kinds of miracles like calling for a drought and calling for uh, um, transforming um, water into uh, blood. Um, once they're done with their testimony, the, excuse me, the beast that is coming from the bottomless pit, pit uh, makes war with them, kills them, and they're being laid into the, uh, um, for three and a half days. Everybody else rejoiced because these two witnesses are gone but then these two, reason, uh, two witnesses raise, they're being, they're being taken into heaven, freaks pretty much everybody else out. And then after that, we have, a, uh, we have an earthquake where 7,000 people die, and this is the second wall. And I'm going to start, obviously, with the uh, first thing first, which would be Revelation 11.8. If you've been into uh, the um, full preterist um, uh, realm for any amount of time, you probably know that this is one of our favorite verses in, um, uh, in arguing um, not only the, uh, the early date, but also the, uh, the entire interpretation of uh, the book of Revelation. And their dead bodies, the dead bodies of the two witnesses, shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Well, from the, rest, from the other chapters of Revelation, we do know who the great city, the wicked great city of Revelation is. It's Babylon. It's the great Babylon, the harlot. But then we have a problem. The, that great city is where our Lord was crucified. Where if you want, if you ever read the Bible, just once you know what is the city where our Lord was crucified. It's Jerusalem of the first century. Let's see if, besides Jerusalem, besides that, the two other nicknames, Sodom and Egypt, fit the description before we, we get too excited about it. Well, Jerusalem was called the, uh, Sodom before in the Bible. We see that in Deut Deuteronomy 32, 32. For their wine, the, their vine is the vine of Sodom. Talk, talking about the last days of Israel. Isaiah 1.10. Hear uh, the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Again, a prophecy about Jerusalem. Isaiah 3.9. And they declare their sin as Sodom, a prophecy about Jerusalem. Jeremiah 23, 14. I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem a horrible thing. They are all of them unto me as Sodom. Also look at uh, Ezekiel and Amos. How about Egypt? Well, let's read the text which says the great city which spiritually is called Egypt. Well, Egypt signified bondage and slavery throughout the Bible. And then Paul comes in Galatians and gives us the spiritual meaning of what this Jerusalem, uh, what this Egypt means. When he, he talks about Abraham and the two sons, and, uh, you know, it says uh, one of them is from Mount Sinai, which give, gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. Hagar was an Egyptian. And for this, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which is now. I don't know how to get it any clearer than that. The, uh, Egypt is the Old Testament uh, Jerusalem. And the same way Egypt persecuted the Jews in the first exodus, in the same way Jer first century Jerusalem persecuted the Christian saints. Now I want to give you a little bit of a food for thought. If you look in Matthew 2.15, uh, the context is um, um, Herod, Herod is about to kill the babies, and an angel comes to Joseph uh, and s tells him, uh, you know, get the baby and Mary and um, run uh, because they're going to be uh, persecuted. And then verse 15 says, this happened in uh, order to fulfill the prophecy which says, I called out my son from Egypt. All right? But the problem is, verse 15 comes right after the coming out of Judea. The coming out of physical land of Egypt happens only in verse 21. So the re I think the reason Matthew put Egypt, where he uh, put verse 15, where he put it, is because he meant, I'm going to take out my son from that Egypt, that land that is now wicked uh, and really meaning Judea. Food for thought. You may agree or not with me.
So, oops, I missed my point. So, with that being said, the only city that can fit the, descri the description of the great, um, the great Babylon, uh, where the Lord was slain, is first century Jerusalem. It's not Rome, it's not New York, it's not Babylon, it's not Mecca. I've heard now Preston is doing a review on a book of a guy that says that it's Mecca. No, it's not. It's first century Jerusalem. Let's spend a little bit of time with, uh, uh, talking about the uh, 42 months and uh, 1260 days. I would submit to you that the 42 months are not the same as the 1260 days, although they both refer to the same amount of time, three and a half years, but they're not the same. Let's look at the text again. And the holy city shall they tread under the foot 40 and two months, and I will give power unto my witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and sixty days. Now we have the, pro the prophets, the two witnesses, in sackcloth, which means they are prophesying bad things, judgment, uh, you know, terrible times. But usually you do the prophecy first, and then you have the treading uh, under the foot for 42 months. In other words, prophecy first, fulfillment later. If you do the prophecy and fulfillment at the same time, you're not prophesying the events, you're reporting the events. Also, the witnesses die while the city is still standing and it's rejoicing. You cannot rejoice when you're uh, uh, tread under the foot, which, uh, which means you have... <laughs> So you Good have point. to have the, the, the death first and then the, the punishment, then the, the, tri the, um, um, the treading under the foot, basically. Another point is, uh, initially the nations are angry on the witnesses, and we're going to look a little bit more the, um, in verse 18. This is also Acts 4.25, quoting Psalm 21. So you have the nations are getting angry, then the witnesses die, and then, verse 8 says, the wrath of God comes against Jerusalem. So, again, because of the series of the event, uh, we have the 1260 days first and the 42 months coming after. There is more, I have more um, proof that these two per uh, periods of time cannot coincide whatsoever. Um, I'm kind of running out of time, so I want to... Uh, go over that, but go over that uh, a, bit, a little bit uh, quicker. If you're interested, I, the PowerPoint is available. However, another food for thought for you. What if, just what if, we take the uh, 1260 days and we take the 42 months and we add them together, three and a half years, plus three and a half years, total of seven years, could, be, could these be the seven years of tribulation? I don't know, food for thought. And now let's get into the uh, most controversial uh, part, the two witnesses. Who are these two witnesses? I'm gonna say that uh, this passage uh, regarding the two witnesses and specifically identifying the, uh, the two witnesses is the hard, one of the hardest and most controversial passage in the Bible and in the book of Revelation. Depending on how you interpret the book, depending on how you look at those, these two witnesses, you can come up with all kinds of types of identity. It could be a literal, um, a literal meaning. It could be a symbolic meaning. It could be individuals, two individuals. It could be groups of people. Or it could be just um, not even people at all, but other sorts of identities. And if you look online, if you look into li the literature, you're going to find all kinds of identities. Because some common one, and I don't think this, that by far this is not an exhaustive list, is uh, the two Christians entrapped in the city of Jerusalem. Apostle Peter, Apostle Paul, or James and Paul. You have maybe Moses and Elijah. Some others say it's Enoch and Elijah. Some say, no, it's not people. It's actually the Old Testament and the New Testament. Some others say it's two groups of people. On one hand, the Old Testament prophets. On the other hand, you have the New Testament apostles. Well, I, uh, I'm going to give you rather some criteria on how to look at identifying the two witnesses. I'm going to give you eventually my, uh, my uh, position too. But I want you to, uh, to uh, rather look how we think 
when we try to identify this, these two witnesses. And I will submit to you that Zechariah chapters 2 through 4, really 1 through 4, are, it is Revelation chapter 11. Zechariah 2 to 4 is a type, is a shadow, is a, is a precursor, if you please, of Revelation chapter 11. You understand Zechariah uh, chapters 2 to 4, you will understand Revelation 11. And the reason I'm saying this is because the book of Zechariah appears in the historical context of rebuilding the Jerusalem after the Babylonian uh, exile. After the 70 years in Babylon, they come back and the book of Zechariah is written in that context of rebuilding Jerusalem and the, uh, the temple, uh, the, the second temple. On the other hand, Revelation is the renewal of the temple. Remember, we talked about that measuring, destroying and bringing something new, uh, remake. And we're going to look at a little, uh, few motifs that are uh, common, I think, between Zechariah 1 through 4 and Revelation 11. One of them would be the measuring team. We saw the measuring team in Revelation. We also see it in Zechariah, where it says, A line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. Also, uh, we're, uh, Zechariah is told to measure Jerusalem. We have the two witnesses team. This would be the main team, obviously. We see that in Zechariah 4.3, and uh, we see it in Revelation 11 as well. We uh, have another team the escaping from or running out of Babylon. Remember in, in uh, Revelation 11, the two witnesses are taken out. They, uh, it, they're being told, get out of Babylon. Get out of that city and they're taken up to heaven into a cloud. Same thing, um, Zechariah says, Up Zion, escape you who dwell in the daughter of Babylon. Perfect correlation, perfect parallelism. Another uh, a common th uh, theme between the two passages is God is making tabernacle with his people. In Zechariah, we're, to we're told twice, I will dwell in your midst. I will, I will dwell in your midst. In Revelation, uh, especially in the later part of it, we have God ruling. Uh, where is he ruling? Among his people. We also see the removal of sin. In, uh, in Zechariah 3, 4, 9, it says, I have removed your iniquity from you. I will remove the iniquity. In Revelation 11, 19, we have, and we're going to see, the uh, end of the uh, law of the Old Covenant, which is the strength of sin. You remove, um, you remove this, the, uh, the law, you put, which is the power of sin. So since we... I hope we agree about these similarities that are in between Revelation 11 and Zechariah. Um, uh, the, the, these similarities will help us to use Zechariah to identify the, uh, uh, the two witnesses of Revelation 11. And in, if you look in Zechariah verses 3 and 4, we have two characters, two individuals that I think are symbolic for, for what's going on in Revelation 11. And those two characters that are Joshua, who is the high priest. The high priest is being cleansed. We see that in Revelation 3 to 5. Remember what's happening in Revelation 1-1? Uh, we have the measuring and the renewer and uh, basically the, the making new of those that are worshiping the altar and the, uh, uh, and the t in the temple. And then the second character is Zerubbabel. Ezra, Ezra, Ezra calls him the prince of Judah. But it's very interesting because his name actually means born in Babylon. Where was the church of God uh, born? Where was the, fir the first Christian born? In Babylon, the great city where our Lord was crucified. Perfect correlation again. So let's look at some of the, uh, the features, some of the characteristics that two witnesses should have if we compare them with uh, Zerubbabel and Joshua. Obviously, Zerubbabel and Joshua are Jewish. I would submit that the two witnesses also have these Jewish features because there is fire coming out of their mouths. This is a Jewish team taken from 2 King uh, with the Elijah and the Ahaziah's people. We also see that um, whoever harms the two witnesses are supposed to receive the same punishment. Well, what's that? Eye for eye and tooth for tooth. Le Leviticus 24, Jewish to the core. Um, also, they have the power to close the sky and to cause drought. That's, again, taken from the Old Testament. First King, Elijah causes drought for three, interestingly enough, for three and a half years. 
uh, James also alludes to that when he is addressing the uh, diaspora in James 5, 17. The two witnesses, similarly to uh, Zerubbabel and Joshua, come out triumphantly for uh, Babylonian uh, captivity. They're not kind of running out of their life when Cyrus let them go, or actually Darius, when you, uh, um, I know you say Darius, it's Darius. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Across the, the ocean is Darius. <laughs> sure that's the way it is over there. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I had to. <laughs> Happens that Darius was from there. <laughs> Similarly, the two witnesses are taken up in a cloud, which means not only honor, but also power. They are not, they're not running for their lives coming out of the city, basically. That's what I'm getting at. Um, they are two. We have two witnesses, which again is a Jewish motif. Uh, when you have two witnesses, their testimony counts. Whatever these guys say, is, it matters, and it's so. And then, of course, we get that from Deuteronomy. Zerubbabel and Joshua represent both kingship and priesthood. So we have king, we have a king, Zerubbabel, and a priest, uh, Joshua. Besides Melchizedek in Old Testament and Jesus in the New Testament, who else has both titles? Let's look at 1 Peter 2.9. But you, talking to Jewish diaspora, are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, king and priest. See also Revelation uh, 1.6. He made us kings and priests. Also, this is very problematic to our brotherhood in the churches of Christ. The two, wit two witnesses have the gift of prophecy, which means they can only activate during the charismata pre period. Amen. So, in other Amen. words, you, right. cannot have, you cannot have the two witnesses in the future in, on one hand, and on the other hand saying that the uh, miraculous gift of the Holy Spirit ended with the apostolic era. In, in other words, you can only be futurist or uh, cessationist, but you cannot be both. Another characteristic, the two witnesses are persecuted and killed. Since they are witnesses, since they are prophets, they have to be vindicated for Jesus. When did Jesus say that the, the witnesses will be vindicated? In that generation, his generation. This is also Daniel 7.21 if you want to uh, go deeper. The two witnesses, um, the two witnesses un unburied bodies bring more cur curse about the city. I'm not sure if we actually have some physical bodies laying in the, in the um, city, but what the point I think it is, is that in Jewish mind, if you leave um, bodies um, unburied, that brings curse upon that that doesn't bury the bodies. So even more uh, curse, even more punishment is ready to be poured upon the great uh, city. And uh, Jesus made it clear, again, back to who is that great city. A, a prophet cannot perish out of Jerusalem. Where are the, body laying? Where are, where are the bodies laying? In, the, in Jerusalem. The two witnesses, and especially their testimony, is, uh, is known by a large number of people because when they die, everybody is, you know, uh, cherishing and sending gift to, gifts to one another. What is Paul saying? Their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. Their testimony is being known to everybody, whether they like it or not. Uh, and another note, when the two witnesses therefore finish their testimony, verse 7, uh, uh, Revelation 11 says that, the end will come, per Matthew 24, 14. The two witnesses are being raised up and taken to heaven in a cloud. That means that whoever they are, they benefit resurrection, which happens then. Another food for thought. Could these two witnesses, a uh, replica of a, uh, a second Exodus replica of the two witnesses that we found in Joshua chapter 2 before the Jericho's destruction? Remember, 
there are two witnesses that are being sent just before Jericho was destroyed. Could these be a replica? These two witnesses can be a replica before Jerusalem uh, fell? I don't know. You be the judge. So, based on everything I said so far, my AT&T position, my at this time position is that the two witnesses represent the Christian Jews, specifically the remnant or the first fruit. Those Jews that are spoke for God, that's a prophet, really, somebody that spoke, speaks for God, and he, they uh, carry over the gospel, probably those that are in the last, uh, in the last days uh, before uh, the um, uh, Roman Jewish um, war uh, started. That's my position. You may agree with it. Uh, it's up to uh, discussion. I may even change my position if I find something uh, more, uh, more relevant. But based on the criteria that I presented so far, I think this group of people is um, a good fit for uh, the two witnesses. How about the earthquake of verse uh, 13? Well, Adam Marshak in uh, 2016 at the Blue, uh, Blue Pond Bible Church uh, talking about this same uh, subject, made an interesting uh, uh, argument saying that this could be literal. And he brings up a, a couple texts there, the references are there, uh, from Josephus, where Josephus records that there are 8,500 dead bodies. Well, in Josephus, we find uh, not only an earthquake, but an earthquake accompanied by, um, by a storm, by a very unusual storm. And then they're followed by uh, the, uh, an attack of uh, Idumeans. Uh, and Adam makes the, makes the uh, argument that the reason Josephus says that there are 8,500 casualties uh, would match if we take the 7,000 uh, bodies from Revelation that are being killed in an earthquake and then another 1,500 from the uh, attack of the uh, Idumeans, you know, having the sum of 8,500. I don't know. It's possible. It's possible. Uh, another kind of food for thought, I'm kind of leaning towards it, about the uh, 7,000 that are killed in verse 13 by this earthquake could be just the, um, uh, just the, um, the symbol for, uh, for um, or not necessarily a symbol, but the, the, uh, the representation of the God's uh, vindication for the remnant. If I identify the two witnesses correct, and if they are the remnant, then Paul said in Romans, uh, quoting uh, first King, I have reserved myself 7,000 men who have not bound the knee uh, to the image of Baal. Even so, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. If these are the uh, two witnesses, they would be you know, 7,000, 7, I understand it's symbolic, but then because those two witnesses are being killed, aka 7,000 people are killed, then you have 7,000 uh, that are killed by the earthquake, the, this being the second woe. This would be a vindication for God because it says in that hour. So it's the, the, the two events have to be related in some, uh, uh, in some way. The, the death of the two witnesses and the... Uh, uh, the, the earthquake. All right, and we got to part three. Um, again, I'm not going to read it. I'm going to leave you to that. We're kind of running out of time. Um, there are a couple uh, important elements that I want to talk about regarding this, uh, this last section. One is uh, the seventh trumpet is the last trumpet. Right. After the last trumpet, there is no more trumpet. And as Scott pointed out very well uh, just uh, an hour ago, that's when God's mystery ends. That The seventh trumpet puts an end to the apocalyptic story and uh, also puts an end to God's redemption story. Uh, I believe that uh, Revelation is a, a reiteration of the same story. It's being told several times. And I think chapter 11 is the finishing of one iteration and then Chapter 12 that you're going to uh, speak about tomorrow is the restarting of that uh, same uh, story from another angle. Mm -hmm. But I want you to remember, whatever I'm about to say, we already established the time frame. It's the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. 
And I put together a chart that would give you a, um, a, ref a um, comparison between the trumpet that we find, the last trumpet that we find in Revelation 11, and the trumpets in general, and the last trumpet specifically that we find in other places in the book. When it comes to the uh, trumpet in Revelation 11 15, some events that go or are triggered by the, tr the trumpet are resurrection of the dead, inheritance or inc incorruptibility for the worthies, uh, destructions of tho for those on earth. We have the power of God is now full. God is fully ruling. With the same token, say, uh, Satan is, dest uh, is destroyed because he has no more kingdom. God is ruling over all kingdoms. Verse 15 of Revelation 11. We also, we're going to see just in, in just a minute, there is a change of the covenants when the trumpets sound. Um, th this, th this symbol of sounding the trumpet comes from the uh, trumpet feast. Uh, when, when the trumpet sounded, you would have rest, you would have a gathering together, and you were, it signifies judgment. You also see in Isaiah, when, uh, when he prophesies about the future sounding of the trumpet, you're going to see in Isaiah 27, 13, that it talks about resurrection, because it talks about the gathering together, and uh, when all will worship Yahweh, which means uh, pow the power of God is full. Now, we also see in the New Testament the last trumpet, which is, has to be the same trumpet of Revelation 11 for which we established already. That's in 70 AD. And there would be, and every time we see the trumpet, we're going to see in the New Testament, we're going to see again resurrection, incorruptibility, last enemy is destroyed, change of covenants. In Thessalonians, resurrection, God is ruler of the air. Remember? the destruction of Satan because God rules even in the air, um, everywhere. He's, he, he's ruler over all the kingdoms. Um, you also have the, uh, the inheritance being with the Lord. And I wish I can develop that, but I don't have time for today. Um, also in Matthew, same thing. When the trumpet sounds, you have resurrection, same gathering together, power, great glory, destruction, shaken of the powers uh, of heaven, which means the change of the covenant. The other um, topic that I want to talk within this last part of Revelation is the change of the covenants. This is very important and very troublesome for our, uh, um, our brotherhood and churches of Christ, which claim that the uh, change of the covenants happened at the cross. Uh, here's, I, put another, I put together another chart that, comparises, that makes a, comp a comparison between Revelation 11 on one hand and all the uh, events that are going on there, uh, which I believe... Uh, represent the, uh, um, the giving of the second covenant and the, the uh, elements that happen in the first exodus when the first covenant is being given. Here we go. In the second covenant, when the trumpet sounds, we have the, the, the sound of the trumpet, verse 15. Well, in exodus, it happens that we also hear a trumpet when the covenant was given. We have the presence of the Ark of the Covenant, Exodus 25, the Ark you shall put a testimony. We see the same Ark in uh, Revelation 11. Also, when the first covenant was given, we had thunders, lightning, earthquake. When the uh, Revelation 11 is talking about these uh, God ruling, God uh, rewarding his, his saints now, he also, there is lightning, thundering, and earthquake. These are symbols for giving a covenant, when God makes a covenant. You also have the presence of the elders, both in Exodus and also you have the 24 elders in Revelation 11. Next one is actually a, a um, not a contradiction, a um, opposition, if you please. When the first covenant was given, we have access denied if, onto Mount Sinai. Because the first covenant was not able to remove sin, and the first covenant was not able to f to make uh, a complete to restore completely the relationship between man and God. But with the second uh, covenant, we have access granted because the temple of God was now opened in heaven. Man has full entrance into the presence of God under the second covenant. And then also, you, obviously, you have the subjects that the covenant is made. In first Exodus, uh, the, um, uh, the Israelites are called a holy nation. In the second covenant, you have the prophets and the saints and those who fear God's name. Um, 
with all these put together, remember the time frame for this is Revelation 11, uh, of Revelation 11 is the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And I would, because of this, I would strongly emphasize that this cannot happen at the cross. You don't have any of these elements uh, at the cross, which means the law did not pass at the cross. Uh, a couple more considerations before we, before we get to the conclusions. Uh, is Jesus going to surrender the kingdom to the Father? We have this um, um, theory, I would call it, this doctrine, that, uh, taken from 1 Corinthians 15, 28, that when, uh, when uh, Jesus comes, he will surrender the kingdom to the Father, and basically he will be kingless or kingdomless. I would say no. Revelation 11 is one good proof that you can counter that argument because Revelation 11, 15 says the kingdom of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. There is no surrounding or uh, submission or uh, giving away the kingdom. Another point, and point that I want to make is uh, the nations were angry in verse eight, uh, 18. Who are the nations? And I'm going to submit to you that this is the verse 18 actually refers to uh, Acts 4, verses 25 and 28, where um, uh, Luke mentioned this, but it's really Peter talking uh, about, um, about the same, uh, they, they, he asks the same question. Why did the heathen rage? This is actually taken from Psalm 2, 1 and 2. And, that, um, and then we have, who are these uh, um, who are these hidden? And we know about them. Uh, we, we find out who they are. One, the last one, the most important, and the people of Israel. Which means, uh, when the, time, when the uh, punishment in Revelation 11 comes, God will punish them, this hidden rage, and uh, will, will punish them then, uh, when the uh, Revelation uh, 11 was, uh, was supposed to uh, happen, which is uh, 70 A.D. Because uh, it says, but uh, Tyrat has come. Also, verse 18, I'm going to submit to you that it's actually the, uh, Daniel 12, 2. It's resurrection of the just and the unjust. And Daniel 12, 7 says also when this will happen. When the power of the holy people shall be completely shattered. So, um, again, perfect harmony, perfect analogy. Um, also, we have the rewarding of the uh, saints to their inheritance in verse 18. This is Daniel 12, 13. Because Daniel is, to, uh, is told, but go to, your whale, go to your way till the end, and you shall rest and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of the days. Daniel, at the end of the days, is supposed to get his inheritance, and sa the saints are getting their inheritance in Revelation 11. So my question for you that I'm going to leave you with both here and at uh, those who are watching online, is Daniel still in Hades today? Is that a good news for Daniel that he is still in Hades today? So we get to the conclusions. Revelation 11 is a key chapter in the book of Revelation and really for the uh, fulfilled eschatology. Most of the elements of eschatology are present in the chapter 11. If you preachers ever run into, I need to talk ask about a certain topic in, uh, about a certain topic, go to Revelation 11. You're probably going to find it there. The city uh, of uh, Revelation 11 is first century Jerusalem. If you don't remember anything else that I said tonight, I want you to stay with this. Re the Revelation 11 and the great uh, Babylon, the great city, is first century Jerusalem. There's no way around it. Revelation 11 closes the story of uh, God's redemption. We, we saw that already, which means God is fully and forever ruling. We have no more spiritual enemies. The heavenly temple of God is now open. Amen. We have we have access into God's presence once for all. Today, we enter in the inheritance through baptism. The inheritance of God. And I'm going to take the minute because it's too cold. When, <laughs> when uh, remember when the, um, 
Jewish, uh, the Israelites enter into, uh, into the promised land, into Canaan. And everybody got their piece of land, except one, uh, one uh, tribe. Who was those? Who are those? The Levites. And what God say? You're not going to get any piece of land because I am your inheritance. So we Christians today have an inheritance. Who's our inheritance? God. Thank you. So today we enjoy the fullness of blessings under this new covenant that was given in Revelation 11, uh, of which sign was the, uh, um, the fall of Jerusalem. And I'm going to leave you with a, a little animation that I make with the uh, older um, references that I use for uh, uh, Revelation 11 with the uh, uh, rest of the uh, Bible. I hope this has been informative for you, and I would like to thank you for uh, your time and for your attention. Oh. <laughs> I told you, the rambling Romanian would do a great job, and he has done a wonderful job uh, tonight. So thank you, Robert. Well put together, uh, well presented uh, lesson. There may be some nuances we'll talk about tonight, but it was so uh, well put together, I'm not going to say anything. And then in Revelation 11 and verse 19, the power of this whole lesson is that the temple of God is opened in heaven. That is such wonderful news. That's some of the best news I think I've ever discovered uh, from the Bible. And it was in this chapter. And you brought that out because you proved it was Jerusalem. And the temple was falling. And a great temple of God was opened in heaven. And brethren, that's not heresy. That's gospel truth. That's what that is. It's just so wonderful. So thank you, Robert. It was a great lesson. You really put together. You know, you could tell he studied, didn't he? He studied on that lesson. He really put that together well. So I appreciate so much.